Can O'Donnell protect the Western Pass into Ulster? Will the Southern Chiefs stand firm against the English? And a close friend of Elizabeth I turned traitor. Following the successive defeats in Ireland at the hands of O'Neill, Queen Elizabeth I had been troubled over her choice of military commander in Ireland. At the time, two factions dominated her court, one led by Robert Cecil, the other led by Robert Devereux, who, being close with the Queen, was a favourite of hers. Each of them tried to diminish the other's influence in court, and neither of them wanted the appointment of commander in Ireland, as it would remove them from court. During the council debate over the appointment, Essex turned his back on the Queen, and she lost her temper, striking him across the head. He laid his hand on the hilt of his sword, but was held back by the Lord Admiral. Before leaving the chamber, it is said that he called the Queen as crooked in her disposition as in her carcass. Eventually, Essex found himself with no choice but to offer his services, which the Queen accepted. Essex was especially popular in London, where he was considered a pillar of Protestantism. Prayers were offered in churches for his success, and he was cheered on through a double line of citizens for four miles. Essex commanded a force of 16,000 troops, along with a cavalry of 1,300 horse. The plan provided for reinforcements of up to 2,000 troops from England every three months to make up for expected losses. Essex also had command of five warships, with an assortment of flyboats, which were intended for a landing at Loch Foyle in the north. This strategy of attacking by land and sea would eventually be abandoned when it became clear it would fail due to lack of resources. Essex ordered 5,000 troops into garrisons along the border of the Pale. He also reinforced Cork on the south, as well as Kilkenny, and in the west he reinforced Sir Conyers Clifford with 3,000 troops. The council in London wanted a straight attack north into Ulster, but conditions on the ground had set Essex in opposition to that proposal. He put the threat from the north on hold, and chose instead to head south into Munster. Essex set out from Dublin on the 9th of May 1599. He marched south, taking the castle of Atai. He then relieved the fort of Maryborough, and following this, his first significant engagement came at the Pass of Cashel. Essex's forces moved through the pass in a frontal assault and pressed through to open country. The English admitted the loss of three officers and several men, although the Irish claimed 500 were killed. On the 18th of May, Essex marched south to Kilkenny with two-thirds of his force. The city welcomed him with lively orations from the local dignitaries. After meeting with Thomas Norris, he departed on May 22nd with 2,500 foot and 300 horse, and was welcomed in the town of Clonmel. Two miles below the town on the River Shure, the castle of Derry Lair was surrendered, and Essex then fixed his sights on Caer Castle, the strongest fortress in Ireland. Essex, who was determined to capture the castle, drew plans to besiege it. Supplies, however, were running low, there was also a rumour that a rebel force of 5,000 had mustered in the vicinity. On Saturday the 26th, he ordered a detachment of 300 to seize the orchard garden on the south side. This was readily achieved with the loss of only a few men, and on the 28th the east wall was breached, with the castle being taken the following morning. Queen Elizabeth dismissed her commander's achievement, claiming the defenders were merely a rabble of rogues. Following this, Essex marched west to Limerick City, where he was well received on the 4th of June. He then marched south, but conditions had begun to deteriorate. There was no money, no ammunition, no food and scarce enough cows to supply the army for two days. He marched unhindered eastward to Waterford. The way to Dublin was north by Wicklow, where the English commander Henry Harrington had been heavily defeated a month prior at the Battle of Deputies Pass by the O'Burns. 
The O'Byrnes had been allied with O'Neill since the outbreak of the war. Fake McHugh O'Byrne had worked with O'Neill so much, he was described as his right arm in Leinster. Their coat of arms, three hands and a white chevron. Their motto, I have fought and I conquered. On his way back to Dublin, Essex's men burned villages and houses, until confronted by O'Byrne with 1,000 troops four miles south of Arklow. They skirmished with the rebels, suffering heavy losses. His army's morale was already suffering, and many fled once open country was reached. Essex continued to Dublin, arriving on the 2nd of July. After eight weeks, Essex could barely muster 300 horsemen. Not a single rebel commander had submitted, and no district was left subdued. Many troops had been dispersed in garrisons in Leinster and Munster, and the strength of the army was much reduced by disease and desertion. Essex planned a second offensive beyond the Pale, which went ahead despite the Queen's disapproval. Essex fought on the border of West Meath with the rebel Captain Tyrrell. Arrington took part in the offensive, and Clifford came from the west with reinforcements, only to lose many men in the fighting. A surprise attack on the O'Connors of Offaly was successful. Their corn was burnt, and 500 cows were seized. But Essex had failed once again to engage a significant rebel force and withdrew to Dublin. While the southern O'Connors were being attacked by the Crown forces, the O'Connors of Sligo were being supported by them. There were many different septs of the O'Connor clan throughout Ireland, most of them from Connacht, where they once ruled as kings. The O'Connors of Offaly, however, are an unrelated branch. The O'Connors of Sligo were enemies of the O'Donnells, and the English supported their efforts to retake their territories that the O'Donnells had occupied. Sligo and Ballyshannon were important strategic points for the English, as they were along the western passage into Ulster. O'Donnell quickly besieged O'Connor at Colony Castle, with over 2,000 men in an effort to starve him out. Essex had no option but to support the besieged O'Connor, one of the few Gaelic chieftains left that would support the crown. He ordered the experienced Sir Conyers Clifford, who was based in Athlone, to relieve the castle with 1,500 English and 200 cavalry. O'Donnell left 300 men at Colony Castle under his cousin, Niall Garv O'Donnell, and sent another 600 to Sligo Town. He then joined forces with Conor McDermott, as well as those of Brian Og O'Rourke. The O'Rourkes were the kings of Breffney, modern-day Leitrim. Their coat of arms, two black lions, symbolising courage. Their motto, I govern by serving. The Irish then carefully prepared an ambush site along the English route. O'Donnell had trees placed along the road to impede their progress. Clifford's force marched through Ross Common from Athlone and reached the foot of the Curly Mountains. The expedition was poorly supplied and Clifford's men were tired and hungry. Clifford had received false intelligence that the pass was undefended and he therefore chose to seize the opportunity and march across, promising his troops plenty of beef in the evening. The English came under gunfire, arrow and javelin attack as soon as they reached the first of O'Donnell's barricades. Conor McDermott and his 600 troops moved swiftly into the mountains and took up concealed positions on either side of the bog road. The English moved past and proceeded up the hill where they sustained further casualties as O'Donnell's skirmishers engaged in hit-and-run attacks on the English formation. The further the English advanced, the more intensive the rebels' fire became. Some English soldiers began to lose their nerve and slip away. Eventually, there was a firefight lasting about 90 minutes. As the English advanced, some of the Irish forces believed they should retreat. However, McDermott noticing the heavy casualties in the English ranks ordered his pipers to continue sounding battle songs and believed he could destroy Clifford's entire force. At this point, the English forces began to waver and their advance was halted as the Irish muskets and archers continued to pour fire into their ranks. The English musketeers running low on gunpowder and ammunition retreated, leaving their remaining infantry under intense Irish fire. 
a half-hearted charge by the English eventually turned back and began to retreat. This further demoralized the forces as they watched their only intact formation flee the field. At this point, Brian Oak and his 160 heavy Galloglass soldiers entered the battle, causing panic amongst the English forces. The commander of the vanguard, Alexander Radcliffe, could no longer control his troops. They panicked and collided with the main column. The commander led a charge with his remaining pikemen, but was shot dead. With the English ranks in disarray, the main body of Irish infantry, which had concealed itself over the hill, closed in and fought hand to hand. Clifford tried to regain control over his men, but was killed by a gunshot through the chest. Despite his death, the rearguard managed to maintain some semblance of formation and continued to fight on as others fled the field. The situation was prevented from becoming a complete disaster when the commander of the horse, Sir Griffin Markham, charged uphill and temporarily drove the rebels back. The Galloglass charged the cavalry causing them to retreat back towards the barricade. Though the actions of the English cavalry allowed many of the foot soldiers to escape, Clifford's men were pursued as far as the town of Boyle. The casualties for the English were estimated to be over a thousand. The casualties for the Irish were considered low due to having been in prepared positions along the route. The O'Connors of Sligo surrendered the castle shortly afterwards and reluctantly joined with the rebel forces. After the victory, there was a noticeable increase in the rate of desertion by Irish troops from Essex's army. And by this time, England's control in Ireland was waning, as more Irish lords joined O'Neill's forces, mostly through fear of being left on the losing side. Unhappy with Essex, Queen Elizabeth is said to have raged impotently at the news from Ireland. She walks much in her privy chamber and stamps with her feet at ill news and thrusts her rusty sword at times into the arras in great rage. She could take no more and on the 30th of July 1599 she ordered an immediate attack on O'Neill. Essex departed Dublin on the 28th of August 1599 with a force of 3,700 foot and 300 horse. On the 2nd of December, he marched to Ardee, where O'Neill was sighted with his army on the far side of the river. The English claimed variously that O'Neill had 10,000 foot and 1,000 horse. Heeding counsel not to engage because of the inferiority of his forces, Essex encamped. On the 7th of September, O'Neill's envoy proposed a meeting with Essex at a ford on the river. Essex rejected the meeting place, but the impatient O'Neill found a spot in the river to ride up to his horse's belly. It was a gesture of humility and Essex rode down to meet him, where they conversed for half an hour. After further meetings on the river, a cessation of arms was agreed upon and was to last until May. The terms provided for restitution of all spoils and the rebels were to hold all they had possessed. The terms were committed to writing and signed by O'Neill. The next day, Essex dispersed his army and O'Neill retired with all his forces into the heart of his country. O'Neill was in two minds about the secession and came under pressure from his ally, Red Hugh O'Donnell, who argued that too much had been seceded to the English. O'Neill issued a list of demands on religious freedom, withdrawal of English influence and confirmation of lands in rebel possession. In mid-September 1599, the Queen wrote to Essex with further criticisms and forbade him from leaving Ireland without special warrant. A week later, Essex boldly sailed for England. He reached London on the 28th, where he disturbed the Queen in her chamber before she was fully dressed. Essex revealed only to the Queen what he had passed between him and O'Neill. At first, treason was not suspected, but Elizabeth was outspoken about O'Neill. To trust this traitor upon oath is to trust a devil upon his religion. She ordered no ratification nor pardon without her authority. But in time, she did admit the usefulness of the secession. Meanwhile, Essex was committed to custody and promptly placed under house arrest. In disgrace as well as in political and financial ruin, Essex wrote several letters of submission to the Queen. 
In November 1600, the Queen refused to renew his grant on sweet wines, an action that placed Essex in even deeper financial difficulties. Essex then started creating plans to seize the court by force. Essex's London residence became a focal point for people who were upset with Elizabeth's government. The group discussed Essex's proposal for seizing the court, the tower and the city. Their goal was to force the Queen to change the leaders in her government. On the 7th of February, the Privy Council summoned Essex to appear before them, but he refused. He had lost his chance to take the court by surprise, so he fell back on his scheme to rouse the city of London in his favour, with the claim that Elizabeth's government had planned to murder him and had sold out England to Spain. Essex and his followers hastily planned the rising, and on the next morning, Essex, along with 200 of his followers, made their way to the city. Meanwhile, Sir Robert Cecil sent a warning to the Lord Mayor and the Heralds, denouncing Essex as a traitor. Once the word traitor was used, many of Essex's followers disappeared and none of the citizens joined him as he had expected. Essex's position was desperate, and he decided to return to Essex House. The Queen's men besieged the house, and by that evening, after burning incriminating evidence, Essex surrendered. On the 25th of February, 1601, Essex was beheaded in the confines of the Tower of London. Queen Elizabeth was shocked and devastated by the betrayal of her favourite and despite believing his execution was justified, she grieved for him greatly. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss the next part.